morning, man, we have been battling issues this morning in our sound booth, our media, our internet, and so I apologize for the pauses for you guys this morning. That just lets me know something big's about to take place. Amen. <laughs> hey, we are um, running, today's an odd Sunday, as I was telling the early service, today's the last service this month that I preach in El Dorado. I won't preach here again for a month. That's because we are moving into what we're calling summer revival starting next week, and I'm excited about it. I believe God has really got something predestined and pre-planned for us here. You know, over the last two months, the strategy we've been running with at the Elrated Campus was this, is let's draw people back together and let's celebrate one another in the presence of the Lord. And that's what we've been doing with all of our holidays. You know, Mother's Day, we celebrated mothers. You know, Father's Day, we celebrated fathers. But we brought people out there. Cinco de Mayo was a ball. And we've really enjoyed getting to come back because... Just a couple months ago, we got to just start coming back together as a church, full strength. You know, we've been back in the building for a while, but there were lots of people not able to come back in because of, you know, vaccine shortages or, you know, still high health risk and those kind of things. But, you know, I believe all that is behind us now. Amen. And not saying that COVID is not still real and COVID is not still rampant. Uh, As a matter of fact, uh, my nephew caught COVID this week. And so I still want you to stay very safe. Stay very vigilant. We sprayed this building in between services, just like we always do. We're not letting our guard down. If you're high risk, we ask that you move behind the plexiglass to where we can protect you as best we can. But it's time for us to move into the things that the Lord has for us. Amen? We've been distanced and separated and social distancing too long. I don't know about you, but I've been to social distance so long with people in the church that I kind of started feeling a little social distance from God at times. And so praying about what we're moving into next, I was asking God, God, what is our focus for the rest of the summer? And I felt like the Lord put on my heart, you need to focus on experiencing him. And so that's why we are starting our summer revival starting next week. I'm going to get to be here every service, but next week we got the most beautiful preacher on the planet going to be up here on this stage. And so if you don't like what she has to say, just enjoy looking at her. I do. All right, Jennifer's going to be with us next Sunday. Then the following Sunday, Pastor Jerry and Leah are, we're calling it Open Heaven. We are going to take a full service and focus on just powerful worship and experiencing the presence of God through worship. The Bible says, enter his gates with thanksgiving, enter his courts with praise. Then we're moving into a three-night revival with David Cuppet. I'm excited about that. I've been on the phone with David several times this month. And I believe, and he's excited. He knows God has an encounter here for us at the Elderated Campus. We're talking with Dad. He's going to be in. We're going to share him with Camden for one service. But then the following services, he's going to be with us. And we'll be releasing that schedule. And then I'm pumped about Evangelist Porter coming. I have been a fan from a distance of Evangelist Porter. And got to watch what God uses him to do. I know his father very well. But um, never got to really meet him and communicate with him. But his mother put me and him in contact, and he was able to clear his schedule to be with us the last Sunday of this month. You're talking about a powerful man of God. I'm excited about him going to be here with us, too. And then, rolling right into that, uh, we're going back into school, uh, starting cranking back up in August. And when school cranks back up, Jason David is going to come be with us for a week this time. Instead of just coming in for a service, he's going to come in with us for a week, and he's going to minister, and he's going to praise and he's going to worship and he's going to make us laugh and I'm sure make us cry but he's going to bring the presence of God all the way from California with us and talking with Justin on the phone yesterday he started stirring something up we're going to begin to lay out our summer our um, I mean our fall calendar our fall concert calendar it got me he called me about a a band wanting to come in and do a concert and got me rolling the rest of the time thinking, oh, what other bands can we want to do a concert series through the rest of the year? And so once a month I would like to bring in a different genre of worship, gospel. I'm even looking at a couple of different rap artists this year. So, man, I'm ready to get back together and have church, aren't you? Well, it's odd, like I say, knowing that this would be the last message I preach in El Dorado, I'll be preaching in Gulf Shores still weekly there, but last week I'm going to be preaching in El Dorado for a month. I was like, what what do you want me to say? And um, I preached a message in the early service, and I walked down. I was like, guys, I've never floundered so hard in a service in my life. I've been trying to put my finger on what God is wanting to say in here today. And um, I know this is all I keep hearing. 
The Bible says, like John the Baptist, his message was, prepare ye the way of the Lord. So that's what we're going to talk about today. You know, if, you, if we're about to move into a, an encounter or an experience with God, there's a preparation that takes place before it does. You know, my family's just been at my house. They've never done what they just did at my house. Um, my parents have actually never stayed at my house a week in the last 15 years. They would come by or things, but this year my mom and dad called me and said, Hey, Crick, the um, COVID is over. And so they got vaccinated. They've not got to hang out with the grandkids. And the grandkids have all been separated. If you don't know, my parents have uh, 16 grandkids. And so they said, you know, we've looked at booking things. And you can't book anything. If, you're, if you haven't booked your family vacation yet, good luck, guys. Everything's booked up. <laughs> all right. They've been taking reservations to go to national parks right now. The summer, people are out and about. So they said, girl, we can't get anywhere. So can we just come to your house? And I thought, yeah, Mom, Dad, you can come. And they said, can we bring the grandkids? And I was like, which one? She said, all of them. <laughs> and so I live in a house with three daughters and a wife and three dogs. And we got six chickens and we got like ten fish. And our house is already pretty full. But to have 13 kids under the age of 13 at my house for seven days has been very interesting. But I'm so glad that Mom gave us an advance notice because they called us back in April and said, this is what we want to do. Now, my brother and sister brought their camper down, so the boys stayed in the camper, all the girls stayed in the house, but still, there's a lot of kids in my house. And um, what went on there was, you know, for two months, every time I was home, I'll, Jennifer always has a honeydew list for me to do, but when Jennifer found out my parents and 13 kids were coming to stay at our house, my honeydew gr list grew huge. And literally for the last two months, if I was not at work or if I was at home, we were working on projects getting ready for this house. I mean, for this trip that just took place this week. Somebody told Brother Maurice, said, boy, you're getting dark. Or how do you say? You say, you're getting black. And I said, everybody thinks I've been on vacation. I've been in my yard with 13 kids for the last week. Um, and, but it, it just didn't happen. In other words, they didn't just show up and everything was ready and go well because if they would not have called us in April and told us they were coming then then they would have showed up at the condition our house was in then compared to the condition that it's in now this trip would have been a lot different you know we were prepared and we were ready number one it was clean so Jennifer wasn't griping at me the whole time all right so we got the house clean before they got there but number two I had plenty of time to take all my valuables stuff that's important to me and get them put in places that would be safe to where, you know what I'm saying, they wouldn't be taken out. I was, uh, we have a pet squirrel, and Chris gave us a pet squirrel, and I was able to get the squirrel cage in a place that would be you would call kid-friendly. So we didn't have squirrels chewing up kids. And, you know, we were able to, I was able to put a lock on my bedroom door so that I didn't have kids coming into my room. That was off limits. And we had time to be able to get the backyard set up and ready to be able to feed 13 kids every meal. We got the you know, the pool set up. We got everything. Took it, and literally, that's what, for the last two months, if I wasn't at work and I wasn't in church, I was working, getting ready for an event. And the girl, all the kids went home yesterday, and uh, they were all super tired, and I don't think they slept an hour. I mean, kids, it's amazing how God gives them energy. They would get up early and stay up till early. And so we are all adults. We're dragging and crawling, but they had the best time. I mean, driving home. They were all like, this has been the greatest vacation. The truth be told, we didn't do much. They didn't do much. We didn't go to all the big events or amusement parks. They went to the beach for about an hour every day, and then the rest of the time they stayed in our yard. It was a very successful vacation for them. And it changed, like me and my dad were talking, and what he was saying was, man, he really feels like this vacation changed some major things in these kids' future because a week like this, with just them, you know, they go to Bible camps together and things like that, but other, but a week, it was 13 of them, just them, all together doing everything. The relationship, the bonds that were built will probably last these kids the rest of their life. I mean, they'll always, saying that, say this, that experience was such a life changer in their relationships. I believe July is going to be that for our church. I believe July is going to be that for you and your relationship with the Lord. But again, Things just don't happen. It took two months of us preparing our house, getting rid of all the junk food out of the 
pantry so that we could control the meals, getting rid of, you know what I'm saying, all the uh, clutter that was laying around in the house where kids could lay a mattress on the floor and sleep and putting places in the right place and rearranging things in the right order. I mean, literally, we worked our bottom ends off for the last two months. And saying that to say this, they left yesterday. And I left yesterday. And um, I called Jen last night. I said, well, how, how's the house? How's the yard? Because I figured she was going to have to work her bottom end off all day just trying to get the house back together again. And she said, you know, when they left, it was actually in better shape than when we before, before we even began to prepare. It's amazing what God will do when you prepare for him to come. And so I'm expecting a move of God here over the next month. Because the Bible says if we seek the Lord, he, will, he is a rewarder. Now, you say, well, Cricket, how do we know if we catch the Lord? You don't get rewarded for catching the Lord. You get rewarded for just seeking the Lord. You know, our mindset tells us this. You know, when you're watching TV and a crime show comes up and it says that if you, uh, you know, uh, crime stoppers, we will give a reward to anyone that gives any information that leads to the arrest or capture of. In other words, worldly system says you don't get rewarded unless it's apprehended. That's not spiritually the way things work. God says this, you just put the effort in to experiencing me, and it's my responsibility to reward you and to give you the experience that you're longing and desiring for. I believe there is an experience on our radar. I believe there is an encounter. All of these are big church words. But another way, I think we're going to see God do some stuff. And we've prayed. We believe God for the speakers and things to bring in. We want to create an atmosphere for him to be here. But I feel like the Lord today is telling me that my job is like John the Baptist. I don't know why I always get to be the weird preacher. Because that's what John the Baptist was. Jesus was the cool guy. John the Baptist was wearing, you know, camel's hair and eating bugs. So I guess I fit that category of preparing things. But in this summer revival, I believe today my job is to prepare you for the way of the Lord. So we're going to jump on a few things real quick, just a couple practical principles I'm going to ask you to move into going into this next month. I don't know where, where you're at, but I've tried to bring in or we tried to plan this month to be powerful. Jennifer has a strong inner healing ministry. Why? Because... God, used, God had to inner heal Jennifer through a lot of hurt, a lot of abuse, a lot of hidden shame. And, you know, a lot of that was public from when we walked through it as a family. But what's come out of that is Jennifer is anointed, powerful woman of God that carries an anointing to inner heal and carries an anointing to help transform you out of what you've been through into what God is calling you into. And so I wanted to start this thing off with, um, our revival off with people that are still trying to hold it together on the inside, but you've been through so much because of what others have done and things you've been through and seen and events and things that have happened that you just feel like that's what you're doing. You're just trying to hold it together. I'm here to tell you, you're not strong enough to hold it together. But Jesus is strong enough to put it together. And just like Jennifer, if you've been with us any length of time, you saw the radical transformation in her life. I mean, she was phenomenal beforehand, but I don't even recognize her some days now. It's, it's a different woman walking around because what I'm seeing is a healed, free woman, not just an amazing wife anymore. So she's coming with that strong anointing. I'm pumped. Then right behind that, I know this. You experience God in the presence of, his, uh, of worship. And so... You know, I want you guys in the next week, it's just to be in a time of just soaking in the praise. So that's why we're having the, the full praise service. And then following up, there are people I know that need a word from God. You've just been lost this year. Dreams have been lost. Directions have been lost. COVID didn't just happen, but your marriage happened. And, you know, your job happened. And the kids happened. And your joy happened. And you're going through all this stuff. And you just need God to speak to your life. And that's why we're bringing in a prophet. Prophet David Covet's coming because of all the prophets I work with right now, I would have to say he's probably the most dead-on key one that moves in the power and anointing of the Holy Ghost and the word of prophecy that I know right now. So that's why we're bringing him in that. And then I need some people to catch back on fire 
COVID just kind of put a wet blanket on things, didn't he? And so bringing in Evangelist Porter, I, I believe in God's, he is a fire starter is what he is. And when, man, he's, when the minute he hits the stage, he's on fire and he's on fire till he walks off. And the thing about fire is it's contagious. If you get too close to it, you're going to get burned. And so I'm believing God that God used him to come in and ignite the heart and passion back in this place and back in the church. Although you guys are always on fire for God, but COVID just kind of worn us out a little bit, isn't it? Let me, let me show you Daniel chapter 7, verse 25, King James Version. Miss Tanya, boy, her job is hard today because the message I preached before, I didn't give her the notes to, and then she put all those notes in, then I've changed this whole message. It won't even be the same. But we're going to go to this scripture real quick because I don't know where you're at. I don't know what you're going through exactly, but I know you're living. And I know if you're living, I know what the enemy's trying to do. And if the enemy's trying to do it, then I know exactly probably how you're feeling because he's the same to everyone. You're not the only one that's going through something. You're not the only one under attack. And Daniel chapter 7, verse uh, 725 says this. And I'll quote it. She'll bring it up. It says, and he shall speak words against the Most High. Uh, speaking of the end, spirit of the Antichrist, speaking lies about God, saying, you know, God doesn't care, God has forgotten you, God's just, you know, busy doing other things, you're not that important, you've messed up too bad. Any of the lies that the devil would speak, the Bible says it comes from the, the devil's the father of all lies, and here in Daniel 7, 25, it says this, and he shall speak words against the Most High. Any voice, thought, or feeling in your life that is negative or if has a negative uh, connotation to the Lord, you need to understand that's a lie. There's nothing negative about God. The Bible says He is good and can only do good. And so the enemy wants you to think that maybe there's something you did or maybe something God has not done and you're in this shape or in this spot now. You need to know something. That's a lie. It says this, and he shall speak great words. Great words, not little things. He's going to constantly keep saying this thing, keep saying this thing to where you feel it, where it zaps the very life out of you. And it says great words against the Most High. It says, and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. How many of you guys feel tired right now? Man, are you just tired? You need to know something. There's nothing wrong with you. This is what the enemy's plan is to do. It says, and to think, to change the times and the laws. I want you to know something. After the year we've all been through, it is not a year to lose anymore. We are moving into a year of harvest season. Because the Bible says that the, um, the, inner, the um, head, it's the Midianites, always would attack right before harvest season. Right before, they would always attack in the spring. Because right before you harvest, the enemy would come in and try to steal it. And see, the reason why the enemy comes after you and has been speaking and going after you right now is because he's wanting to change this time. This is not an ordinary time in history. This time in your life. It's probably one of the most important times you've ever lived. There's no other time like the time we have right now. We're embarking in the greatest time of all history. You can't deny it. You can't turn on the news. You can't just let your jaw drop in awe at the craziness going on all over the world. Everything around this planet, everything that you hear, see, feel, you see the end times are screaming. The Bible has been tell I, I tell Jen because it's like we're just watching the Bible unfold right before our eyes. I mean, when I was a teenager, I used to be freaked out and scared to death of the rapture. I remember I would used to come home, and when I would come home, first thing I would do is holler, Mom, Dad, because I knew I wasn't living right. But if they would holler, Yeah, what? I knew the Lord hadn't come back yet. And so I would come in and holler, and then it would be a weird feeling sometimes. I'd come in and holler, Mom, Dad, and they wouldn't answer. And I would instantly start panicking, thinking, I missed the rapture, missed the rapture. They would be out in the backyard or something. All right, that used to be what the end times felt like to me. But now that, you know, I've grown past, and I've been, man, we are living in the last days. And, you know, you say, well, they've been saying that for years, but there's no year been like this year. We are in the last days. We're closer now than ever before. This is a time that we're about to see God do something. Let me tell you this. God never goes out without a bang. You need to know this. If God is in it, it's going to end amazing. It's, you know, and so there's no way God's going to let it end like 2020. No way. The Bible says in the last day, I'm going to pour out my spirit upon all flesh. We're about to move into a time where we're going to see God do things like we've never seen them before. But he says, the enemy comes against us, though, to wear the saints out. 
to change, to make you think the times and the laws have changed. What laws are those? First is the times, the revival that God's about to do in your life, in your own heart, in your own family. He wants you to think that that's not going to happen. Because when you start thinking that that's not going to happen, the spirit of expectancy leaves. And see, God can't do anything without expectancy. The Bible says that you can't even please the Lord without faith. And so without expectancy in your life that God's about to change your circumstance, God's about to move on your behalf, God's about to do, it doesn't say, you know, that you know, it, it says uh, without faith God can just do a little, or without faith God can just kind of do, a, without faith God can do nothing. And so the enemy wants to wear you out to make you think that times are changed. In other words, this is not your time. You need to know something. You were born for this moment. And the reason why you're still here is because this is your time. The Bible says in uh, Ecclesiastes 3, it says, For every purpose there is a time. You are a purpose, and this is your time. And you need to understand that, that the devil can't stop you. All he can do is convince you that it's not your time. And if he convinces you that, you know what, God's not about to move on your behalf. God's going to leave it in this situation. This is just what life is, and this is what, you know, how things are. Then the enemy will have permission to change your time. You know, you can miss your time. Did you know that? You can miss your time. I can be at the wrong place at the wrong time, or I can be at the wrong place at the right time. You know, when my wife had babies, I was at the hospital all three times. Now, where I was greatly mattered in the future of our family. If I probably wouldn't have been at the hospital at the moment Alexis was born, we might not have had Haley. I'm just letting you know. All right? But where you are at the right time matters. And this is your time. You need to understand that God has great things in store for us right now. And you being where you're, that's why the enemy, I believe, has come against so many so hard to try to get them at the wrong place at the right time. I want you to understand something. I'm so glad that we have social media. I'm so proud. In the last service, Miss Susie Paul was back with us. I, I, I'm saying that she's been with us every single service. Every single service she's been with us online. She's at Bible study every day online. But today, she walked back into the building for the first time in a year and a half because she said, yeah, well, the last couple months they've been traveling but up to then she couldn't because high risk and age and all that and so she was with us but she was waiting to get back into here because you I'm so glad we're on social media I'm so glad we can do all that but I want you to know something that that's not the same thing as being in a corporate anointed place full of the presence of God the couch church is good but you want me to tell you what's better the church church is best and so the present Bible says we're two or three are gathered together. And so, you know, you can be at the wrong place at the right time. You can be online watching church and miss this revival. Over the next month, you can be there and you can miss it. You know, a great place to show that you can be, you can miss it is when Jesus told the 400, or uh, the 420, was it 420? Uh, uh, may have, uh, was it 500? I, I don't have it in my notes. I changed my notes from last time. You'll know the story. When, when Jesus ascended, it says there were 500 there present. Theologians believe there were 500 present when Jesus ascended. And he told them all, go to Jerusalem and wait because I'm going to send to you a comforter, a helper, the Holy Spirit. And the Bible said only 120 actually showed up there and went in. So that means 380 were at the wrong place at the wrong time, at the right time. Because the Bible says when the Holy Spirit blew in there, them people that were in that room, their lives were transformed. Their joy was renewed. Their lives were so full. And the Bible says they received power when the Holy Spirit came upon them. You can be at the wrong place at the right time. So to prepare the way of the Lord, you need to make sure you're at the right place at the right time. Because not every moment is the same. Not every visitation of, well, I can just get it later. You may can, but I never saw it anywhere else in the Bible fire caught up on anybody else's head a lot of people received the holy spirit and i'm sure 380 did had that encounter somewhere but not like those that were there and it says they went out teaching and preaching and they transformed the world as we know it i believe god has something great for us in the month of july and so you need to prepare yourself so how do you be at the right time at the right place before the right time gets there you have to set a calendar 
got to set a calendar because I promise you between now and next week, there's going to be 500 things come up that will try to keep you from being at the right place at the right time. Today, there were 500 reasons trying to keep you from being in the right place. And if you don't set your mind to it now, the enemy may convince you of something. Because let me tell you how the devil works. The devil works constantly to try to keep you from going where God wants you to go. The Bible says in Mark chapter 4 that the disciples got into Jesus said, get into the boat and go to the other side. And so they got in the boat and go to the side. And as they were going, a great tempest came upon them. Now, in the original Greek, that makes reference to a demonic spirit came against them, fighting them. Get trying to keep them from going where they were going. And so the Bible says when the wind began to blow, it says waves, wind and waves began to crash against the ship. The devil sent all kinds of things to try to stop them. And see, we if you don't understand that preparing the way of the Lord, number one is you set in your calendar to be at the right place at the right time, then the enemy will bring in a tempest, a storm, and he will bring things that you can see, like he will cause issues at work or he will cause problems at home or they see, the waves were the things that he could see. They saw, yeah, these things hitting. Sometimes, you know, the enemy said, but then the Bible says sent a wind too. There were things fighting against them that they could not see in the spiritual realm. But see, they knew where Jesus had told them to go. So when it got to where they couldn't get where they were going because of what the enemy was trying to stop them from doing, they went and got a hold of Jesus and got him involved in doing it. You need to right now start setting your calendar and get a hold of Jesus involved in your calendar. Say, God, I'm going to put you first in this month. I'm going to get ready for a revival that I believe you're going to send. I'm going to set my calendar to be at the right place at the right time. And Jesus, I ask you, I ask you to anoint my boss to be able to help me get off when I need to get off. I need to ask you to anoint my husband to get him to act right so that we're going to be able to ask you to anoint my kids to get them start preparing, get a hold to Jesus about this thing now. Because the enemy would love to keep you from being there. Because he wants to change your time. And then it says change the law. What is the law? Well, all the way through the Bible, there are spiritual laws, but one of the major spiritual laws is seed time and harvest. There's some of you guys that have been so and so and so and so and so, and you've been faithful, 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 faithful through this whole COVID thing, through this whole 2020, through the whole financial issues, through the whole marriage, through your whole health attack. You've been faithful, faithful, faithful. But see, you've been planting and so and so and so and so and so and so. You've been faithful. And I, was like, I need a revival to preparation. And so, number one, the preparation is you got to do the work. What is the work? Set your calendar. You know, I've learned this about God. He keeps appointments. Did y'all know that? We want God to have experiences, but that's not the way God works. God keeps appointments. If you read in the book of Leviticus, it said this. The Lord showed up to Moses, and he told Moses that I want you to come to the mountain in three days. And in three days, I want to bring my spirit down upon the mountain, and I want to... Have the people experience my presence. And the Bible said that's what Moses, he gave him a three-day notice. God sets appointments in our lives. The problem is we like to keep God on um, emergency call dial instead of keep appointments. Instead of make things, uh, let me ask you this. How many of you guys have ever had a toothache? All right. When you picked up the phone when that tooth is hurting and you called that dentist and you said, man, my tooth is hurting. Did he say, I'm on my way there right now? No. no. It's all right, guys. we got an opening at 2 o'clock tomorrow. Will you be here? I've never seen anybody that was in real pain not make that appointment. But it's weird when it comes to the spiritual things of God. We want God to come here right now and make house calls when we're in dire need. That's what an ambulance does. It's usually when it's too late. When you're in a spot that you've got to have life support involved. That... We're prying out to God, come here, come here. When God the whole time was setting up appointments, saying, hey, if you'll come meet me here, you'll come meet me here, you'll never get to there. And I believe that's what this month's going to be. We've got to set appointments. Just like he told the children of Israel in three days' time. So you've got to look ahead and you've got to set your calendar and begin to expect that on that day. I remember back years ago when I had to make a major decision in my life about where, what direction me and my family were going to go. What church we were going to take. Were we going to start the Adorator Church? Or Jennifer had us a church in Savannah. And I just did not want to make the wrong choice. Did not want to. I mean, I was praying. You ever prayed and you couldn't hear from God at all? You know what I'm saying? It's like, you didn't know what it did. It's like, the more you prayed, the more stressed you got because you couldn't hear from God. You ever been there? Maybe you're there right now. You got to hear from God from something right now. Well, let me tell you, I saw that, how God sets appointments. So it was like on a Monday of that week. And I said, God, I have to know by Friday 
what I have to do. I have to know because the church in Savannah wasn't going to hold the spot any longer for us. And so I said, God, I got to hear from you. I don't want to miss you. I don't, I, and so I went before I said, God, Friday, I'm going to come. And I spent time with the Lord every day that week. But I said, Friday, I'm going to go up to the church. I'm going to go into the presence of the sanctuary. I'm going to stay in there until I hear you speak. And I got there that Friday morning. And I was so desperate to hear from God at that moment that I walked in. And it was like weird. The minute I knew I was there, but the minute I got in there, everything in the room started distracting me. You ever been there? You go to hear from God, and it's like everything. I remembered I needed to get milk. Jennifer told me to get milk before I come home. And, you know, I was going to get up and go get milk. Or then I remembered I needed to pay my credit card that day or I was going to miss the payment. And then all these things just compounded me. Then all of a sudden, I got to the door about four times to grab the door to walk out and go take care of that stuff, thinking that I'll come back. And I would grab the door, and I would hear like the Lord say, you're going to miss it. You're going to miss it. And so I went and sat down, and I, would take, I took out a notebook, and I said, I'm going to write down everything I need to do so that I don't forget to do it, shut it, but I'm going to keep my appointment here with the Lord. It was like he put me in a waiting room. <laughs> you ever been at the doctor's waiting room? And he's like, everybody else is getting it, but you didn't. So I was sitting there. And then after about 20 minutes, man, it's like I could not hear. It's like the room was just still in the storm, the chaos in my head and all that. But after about a half hour, literally, I, was, I grabbed hope to sit. I said, God, I'm not leaving here till I hear from you. And then the room got still. Always, it's, a, it's amazing when I feel the Prince of God move into a room. It's like the room sits down. It's like the very air in the room comes to the floor. And I felt that. And then I heard God say this. If you'll support her when it's easy, I'll, she'll support you when it's hard. Knew exactly what to do. That was about 17 years ago. And to this very day, Jennifer still support me through some hard things when all I had to do was just support her then. If I wouldn't have heard that, I wouldn't be here today. But see, God kept his appointment. What are you letting set appointments in your life that are taking the place from God? You got to prepare the way of the Lord. All right, so, so it says enter his gates. You got to put the effort in to make sure you're there. Number two, the Lord to prepare... For the way of the Lord, you have to magnify God. It has to be all about Him. See, the way God works is this. God's desperately and hard at work on this earth every single day for His glory to be shown. That's what God does every day. What does God do every day? He works for His glory to be shown. All right? And now, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, In the beginning God created the heavens and earth, the earth was, was void and without form, and darkness covered the face of the earth. You may be in a dark situation right now. That's why I said darkness covered the face of earth. But do you know what the Spirit of God did in the middle of a darkness? It says that His Spirit came and hovered over the water. Do you know why God did that? Because when there's darkness everywhere else, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, will do whatever it takes for His glory to be shown. Do you know what happens when you shine a light in God? The Bible says His light right on top of water. That water reflects that light. So even in the midst of all that darkness going on, the presence in the Holy Spirit of God was still found a way for there to be glory shown in the midst of chaos. But then the Bible says God began to create. And he created on the first day. He said, let there be light. So boom, glory could be seen everywhere. And then he kept going through them all. And on day six, then he said he separated the waters from the land. Now we came into a problem here. Because now if the Holy Spirit came down and hovered over the face of the earth, there were places in the earth that His glory couldn't be seen anymore. Because you can put a light over ground and it doesn't reflect. But see, God's always at work to cause glory to be shown. So before God was done creating, the Bible says He reached down into the ground and picked up dirt and formed it. And then it says He breathed into that dirt. And when He did, Spirit came alive. He said they made, He made man in God's image. So now that it was impossible for there to be glory shown all over the earth because of land, God had to put me and you on it that are made in the image of God so His glory can be shown. Man became the glory of God on the earth. Now, think about it is, see, in your marriage, on your job, in your financial situation, in your health, the glory of God is constantly at work to show God. And so He wants you to be the glory. He wants to put his glory on you and you represent 
what he's doing. That's why God must be magnified because if we'll magnify God, it allows his glory to come upon us to change even the circumstances and situations where the glory of God could not even get into. And that's why revival must take place and must happen. So one, we have to enter his gates. We've got to do the work to get there. Number two, we have to magnify the Lord. you got to get yourself ready in a place that when the glory of God comes, it holds. You, it, when it comes down, it has something to rest upon. So what does that mean? That means you're going to have to make God bigger than everything else in your life that the enemy has been trying to get you to focus on. You know, when, those, when the enemy comes against somebody, the Bible says that when he came against people, when the devil will come, he goes around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. The devil's a meat eater. That's what lions are. They're meat eaters. And so the devil's constantly looking for people that are just covered in meat. Spiritually speaking, over you're living like the flesh, you smell like the flesh, you talk like the flesh, you walk like the flesh. Because if you smell, walk, talk, and you taste like flesh, then the Bible says that the devil goes around like a royal like seeking whom he may devour. Do you know the devil doesn't eat spirits? He only eats flesh. That's, that lions don't eat spirits. So for us to prepare the way of the Lord, we have to decide that I'm going to walk spiritual into what God has me do. There are things that I'm not going to be able to entertain or begin to get into if I'm expecting a revival and I want the glory of God to come. I can't live in the flesh and expect the results of the Spirit. It doesn't work that way. So how do you do that? You make God bigger than you. You make God's way bigger than your way. You desire God more than you desire the things that you want. You magnify Him. You make Him the biggest thing in your life. When God becomes the biggest thing in your life, I'm here to tell you there's nothing you can do to keep the glory of God from coming on you. When God's the biggest thing over your worries, you're so worried about everything. You get up stressing and fretting about everything. When you decide that my God is bigger than this bill, or my God is bigger than this husband, or my God is bigger than my neighbor, or my God is bigger than this cancer, you begin to focus in on magnifying God and getting a bigger picture of who he is. Because, see, the devil constantly is at work trying to shrink your God and inflame your problem. The Bible said this. The Bible said that in the garden, God gave, God gave Adam dominion over everything in it except one tree. One tree was his. He said, don't touch it. And the devil made that one tree so big, Adam couldn't even see all the other that he could have his hands on. That's what the devil does. He tries to make your one problem bigger than everything else. He tries to make your one issue, your one problem bigger than all that God could do. And when the enemy can convince you that the one tree in the midst of a complete garden is the biggest issue and the biggest thing going on, then the enemy can move us out of the place that God wants us to be in. I'm here to tell you, whatever worry, doubt, fear, stress, problem, strife going on, you've got to get yourself to a place that you magnify God bigger than that. You say, well, how do I do that, Cricket? How do you magnify God? One, to magnify something is not to actually make it bigger itself. It's actually you just get a better look of it. You take what you're looking at and get it as close to you as you can. That's what a magnifying glass does. Magnifying glass, you look in it and it makes the little words on the page look like they're a lot bigger in person. You get so close to God that that's all you can see. You prepare yourself for revival by getting as close to God. Now, saying that, say they got a picture here. I'm going to explain what being close to God is like because then I'm going to close. All right? You got that picture, Miss Tanya? Were we able to get it? If they don't have a picture, how many of you guys actually have a physical Bible? All right, this, is, this picture is in the back of your Bible in the, in the pictures of maps, all right? I want to talk about the tabernacle because a lot of people don't understand how to get close to God. And so they spend their whole life going to church and trying. But I want to explain to you because God gave us an exact road map how to get close to God. When he was in the wilderness with the children of Israel, these people had been 400 years without experience and touching or feeling the presence of God. And so God moved them into a place to where they could actually see, feel and experience God again. I don't know about you. Has it been a long time since you've had a drink of the Holy Spirit? Has it been a long time since you've had an experience? If it's so, you probably feel just like they did. They've been in and through a lot, and now they find themselves in a, in a really hot, weird, tough place. But 
the thing about it is you don't go through hard, tough, weird spots without the presence of God being available to you. So God said, all right, you're in the wilderness now. So what I need you to do is you need to build a tabernacle so that my presence can be involved even in the midst of your situation. Now, the problem with the wilderness is this. They get extremely hot in the day and extremely cold at night. People, as many people freeze in, in the deserts in the in the um, in deserts around the world as they do die of heat exhaustion because in the desert conditions, you know, freezing at night happens. Hypothermia sets in. It's not just people dying of heat exhaustion; they also die of freezing. So God said this: All right, if you involve my presence in the midst of your life, even in the cold times, I will be a fire by night. Even in the hot times, I'll be a cloud by day. God's plan for you is to be able to not get you out of your stuff, but to be with you when you go through it. And he put air conditioning on hot days, and he put heater on cold days, and he walked right through you, and it doesn't just say that. The Bible says he led them by the cloud by night, and fire, or fire by night, and cloud by day. But see, a lot of people don't understand how to experience this about God because they don't see the tabernacle as a map. They see it as a house. All right? And so this is actually a map, how we get into the presence of God. The tabernacle actually had three levels now you need to know this you will get as much of God as you want to in this revival completely up to you you have as much of God as you want to because in the old days of the tabernacle there were three levels and you got to understand something that each level had protocols and rules but and only certain people were allowed to go into different levels but if you're a child of God the Bible says, as many that are led by the Spirit, they are the sons of God. The Spirit will lead you into all three of these because you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood. Priests were the only ones that could go in. The rules are different for us, but the map didn't change. So this is the way it was laid out. When God told Moses to build it, he said, first of all, I want you to build an outer court. So I want you to put this fence up outside there because you need to understand, this thing is going to be valuable and important. You're not going to have an experience with God casually. You're not going to have an experience with God casually. You're not going to be able to just live life however, matata, however you want to, and expect God to show up and transform and change you, and you get the experience. Even Paul didn't get that. He was passionately doing what he thought God had told him to do when he encountered God. You will not get to God without passion. And so... This is what the Bible says. The Bible says they put this first wall up. And now the first wall was this. And this is where most people, when it comes to experience or encountering God, this is where most people say, this is what happened. Every day, the priest would get up, come to what they called the outer, outer courts. On the outer courts was a laver, a big bowl of water is what it was. And what would happen is as the people would come up to the tabernacle, they would come and they would offer their sacrifice and they would use the water to clean themselves up. All right? So it was a place of cleansing. Most people have only experienced God at that level. They come to God. They come to church. They live how they want to outside the world, all they want to, do what they want, talk what they want. But then all of a sudden life quits working for them. Things begin to break down. Things get hard. Their joy can't be gotten a hold of anymore. And they find, so what they do is they come to the presence of God, wanting to experience God, and they come to the outer courts. I want you to know something. If your relationship or experience with God is only you ever being forgiven by him, that's a cool thing. Don't get me wrong. Jesus died for specifically that. All right? But that's not what he rose from the dead for. He died for you to be able to get to the outer courts and your life be cleansed and your life be washed and everything and every mistake that has separated you from God be taken care of. But if that's all you do, you'll never experience the fullness that God has for you. So what happened was... Most of the people, the, every, all the millions of people would come to the outer courts and they would come to the gates and they would come in and bring them out and they would, they would, uh, they would uh, use the lever and then they would have their church service and get their feel good and then they would turn right around and go back home and live. As a matter of fact, the Bible says when the presence of God actually came upon the tabernacle, it says they would stand at the door of their tents and watch. And when, it would, when Moses would enter into the Holy of Holies, they would turn back to their tents and eat their food. That was just all they wanted. And I don't know if that's where you are today. If you, your experience with God has just been an outer course experience, it's just been a Sunday to Sunday thing. But I'm here to tell you, there's so much more further than the outer courts. The outer courts is a great thing, but I want you to know something. It's bloody. It's bloody. A lot of tears, a lot of ash, a lot of things go on there. 
And I've got to be honest with you, God has more for you than you coming in church once a week or once a month or once every three months and you're falling on an altar and God forgiving you and bloody laid all over the place, tears running all down your face and you getting fixed and clean and you're getting good about it and getting up and walking back out just to repeat the cycle again. There's more than that experience. The roadmap is, yes, you come in there and God will forgive you for anything. God will, God will cleanse you of everything. But if you don't go any further, you just go right back out the way you were, then the Bible says that they would routinely have to come and offer sacrifice. But then the, the way the Lord told them to build this ark was there was an inner courts. Now, the outer courts, the crowd came to. Everybody came to because everybody wanted to get their fix. All right? But the inner courts, the number got smaller because this is what took place from the inner courts. When they'd walk into the inner courts, there were three things there. There was one, there was showbread, there was incense, and there was a candlestick. Now, this is where a lot of church people step into. And it's so awesome to watch growth happen in someone's life. They come in and they start applying the word to their life. Start putting the showbread in and start feasting and eating on the word. and They can feel the strength coming in and they feel themselves changing and growing stronger. And then they learn to be a worshiper. That's what the incense was. Is, you know, they, they come before the Lord and they worship and offer up an incense, the Bible calls worship, to the Lord. And they're so close to where God wants them. They can feel it. Now they have purpose in their life. Now they're actually experiencing joy. They're actually feeling connected. They're, they're getting into their place where they know God has put them and think about it. And then it's the, the light. They start seeing where they couldn't see before. They start seeing direction. God starts leading them and showing them which way and how to do this and what they should do. But the thing about it is this. If you stop here, it's probably the most dangerous place to be. Because I've watched a lot of people do this. And I've done this a lot myself. I would come in and get forgiven and then realize that there's more. So I would go on in and begin to grow. But as I would grow, it got to be a lot of work. Church on Sunday and Wednesday. Church every Sunday. Read my Bible every day. Go and serve on the usher team. Greet. And the thing about it, this is real dangerous because in a relationship or an encounter with God, this is where religion begins to show up. Because you can do exactly everything that the person is doing that has got the right heart and be doing it for the wrong reason, and you get real religious. Oh, you got to bite the bread right here, and you got to raise your hands just like this, and you got to. And so they get in this experience with God, and it becomes no longer a life, it becomes a religion. And the religion thing becomes a burden on your back that no one can carry. Because religion says that what you're doing is what's going to get you the experience that God's going to have for you. And you need to know something. There's nothing you can do to get God to move on your behalf. Once you begin to know God the way he wants to know you, that's when God begins to transform and have the experience you're longing for. And so there's some that are stuck in the religious walk. You're here today just because you're supposed to. Or you go to church just because you can. And it's all of it's not about... That's as close to the presence of God as I can get. See, there were some in the Old Testament that could only get to that inner courts because they didn't have the position of the highest priest. So that was as close to God as they could get. And they built their whole life getting as close to God as they could get. And that's awesome to me because you think that they were discounted. They weren't. Because you know what the first thing Jesus did? When he died on the cross, he died on the cross for your sins. But you know what the first thing he did when he did it? He ripped that veil that kept people from being able to be just as close as they could be. And now the access, those that had lived that life to get as close to God as they could, now became a doorway, an access that they could get to him. See, you keep doing what you're doing to get as close to God as you can. You don't do it to earn anything. And God will reward you by opening a door into his presence that you couldn't open on your own. Because that door has been open. Because on the next level, 
of an experience of God was this. There was a holy of holies. In that holy of holies, was there, a, there was a box. A box that was intricately built, divinely ordained on how to do it. It's called the Ark of the Covenant. And in the Old Testament, because Jesus hadn't died yet, that's where the presence of God lived. And only one person a year got to walk into that place. And they spent a year, a complete year, preparing for an encounter of God. And if they took it casual, they tied a rope around their leg. Because if they took this preparation time casual and they walked into this experience with God, they fell right over dead. Because you say, that sounds hard. No, you got to understand. In the New Testament, it's this. I watch people spiritually die all the time. All the time. Because they take their encounters with God casually. And so they walk into where God is encountering them, but they just blow it off. They're like, I know Sunday. Or, you know, I, I could do it. I actually heard a preacher that I thought I respected on TV say, Oh, that Holy Spirit, I believe in him, but take him or leave him. I don't really understand the big deal about it. And I lost respect for him right there because I cannot take my Holy Spirit casual. I desperately need him in my life every day. And the reason why your life isn't working at the level you want it to is because you desperately need the Holy Spirit involved in every part of your life every single day. You say, so cricket, should I walk around on pins and needles? Oh, absolutely not. Man, the Bible says we come boldly to the throne of grace and make known. Now, you come in the greatest thing I have in my life is that, you know, it's not that when you say casual cricket, you live without sin cricket. Guys, I got to tell you, I sin all the time. But I don't take it casual. Ask God to forgive me. You want me to tell you how you can tell if sin is casual in your life? Samson showed us best. See, he was a, a Nazarite. Wasn't supposed to cut his hair. Wasn't supposed to touch dead things. Wasn't supposed to, um, supposed to he was supposed to marry a uh, Israelite lady. And I, you could tell he was in trouble spiritually when he was at a party with some people he shouldn't have been with. And the time before, he had killed a lion. And he walked by by and had honey in it. So he got the honey out. He wasn't supposed to touch that. That was sin. And at the next party, he was making a joke about it. Remember, he told the riddle about the lion? You know, what? Stronger than honey is sweet. I mean, he, if you find yourself joking about things in your life that you know God's told you not to touch or do, Sin is casual in your life. It's not that there's an absence of sin. There's an absence of repentance. It's whether or not sin is, right, is there. So can so they, but he would, they, when you would get into this room with this box, inside this box there were three things. There was a bowl of manna. It is so important that you encounter the presence of God in your life because the first thing that's there is provision. You don't have to do it on your own anymore. When you experience the presence of God, the bowl of manna, that's where God would bring down everything they needed to survive every day. When you fight, when you get to a place where you encounter God, you trying to hold it all together, you don't have to anymore. His hand begins to get involved and bring things into your life that you could not do on your own. And you don't have to worry about those. Your needs become His needs. Matter of fact, there's a scripture in Exodus. Me and the prayer team were reading it Monday. It said this, when you do as the Lord commands you and you listen to what He says, He will make your enemies His enemies. And he will make your offenses his offenses. And that's pretty powerful scripture. You know, I need, because I, I got some people I don't like. <laughs> I don't turn God loose on them because my enemy is enemy. But, all right, so I need God's provision. That's what man was, provision. You don't have to live. But then the next thing in that box was these tablets. And a lot of people look tablets as rules. They were the Ten Commandments, the ones God wrote on it. Well, what the Old Testament was rules, what New Testament is freedom. The Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I not, might not sin against thee. Instead of there being just scriptures in the Bible, His word will begin to get into your chest. That's in that inner cat, in that experience with God. His rules was in the chest. His word will get in your heart. And you will find yourself with power not to sin anymore. You'll find your, this is the place where you have power to not be addicted. And you'll have power to be free. And power not to talk like everyone else. And power not to be mean and hateful anymore. You, it's the power. He says, that word of a hidden heart that I might not sin against thee. It's not that you were able to quit. You had the power now to do so. And then there was another thing in there. 
It was called Aaron's Rod. Now, Aaron's Rod was a walking stick. All the leaders, shepherd, carried these walking sticks. And it was a limb that had been cut, stripped, twisted, manipulated, soaked, dried out, now used as a tool. Separated from his life source and put in the hands of a man to be used as he wants to. But see, in that presence, that stick that was dead and dry began to live again. I've never seen anyone that made it into that center place, that most holy place, experience with God, and marriage has not begun to live again, and dreams not begin to live again, and hope not begin to live again. I've never seen someone make it there that what was dead before isn't living now. God raised Lazarus because they got Jesus to come and encounter them there. God will transform your life. And that's what I believe. You say, Grit, what's this message about? It's about encountering the presence of God. So do you want me to tell you the secret to getting there? Just don't stop anywhere else. Keep going. Keep going. Keep coming. Keep showing up. Keep praying. Keep praising. Keep going. Keep moving in. Keep magnifying the Lord. What happens is you're going to find yourself in a place of an encounter with God where now you'll be sin free. You'll be full of joy. Yeah, I got to be honest with you. For years as a Christian, I pretended happy because I thought the fruits of the Spirit were something we manifest. Does that make sense? I got to be happy because I'm a Christian. How you doing? Great. I hear people do it all the time. How you doing? Greatly and highly favored, brother. Yeah, dude. Your car window's busted out. Why don't you tell the truth, man? You're having a rough day. Being a Christian is not fake. Being a Christian is encountering the presence of God, and it's not manifested fruits. It's spontaneous. An orange tree never has to sit there and try to produce oranges. It happens naturally. An apple tree never tries to... i got to be honest with you. I don't wake up and try to be happy anymore. Why? Because I used to stay in the inner courts and try to do all the work of God, and I was trying to fake a smile. But I found... the that God wants me to come into that next place. When I come into that next place, man, even when I don't want to smile, I do. Even when I don't want to love you, I do. Even when I don't do. And it makes you mad sometimes because like with Jen, I want to be mad at Jen sometimes, but I love her too much. And that's not cricket. That's got to be the power of the Holy Spirit at work in me because I'm not that cool of a guy. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's the, it's, you quit getting to be fake and it all becomes real. But it only comes out of an encounter with God. So I want to leave it like this. I want to say this. Are you ready to encounter the presence of God? It's up to you. You can stop at any level you want to. You don't have to come next month at any of the services, even in this service today. You say, Cricket, I don't want to have to wait till next month. I need God now. Well, what's awesome is the veil's been rent. He opened the door. And all you have to do is enter into his gates with thanksgiving you make the effort to get in and enter his courts with praise you magnify the Lord and today is a better day than tomorrow do you know why? because the Bible says let us exalt his name together in a corporate place in a corporate setting when people do it together the spirit is released at a level that is not alone in your car released so you don't have to wait till next week they're going to close out with one powerful song you say well how long do we need to stay there? You know, there's times that um, I could just walk up to the water fountain and take a drink and have enough. I don't know how much you need today, but you're as close to God as you want to be. And you can have as much of God as you want to have. He's here in this place. The presence of God is here. I don't know if there are things in your life that need to be laid down and forgiven for. I don't know if you're on the outer courts and you need to ask God to forgive you so that you can enter on in. I don't know if you're on the inside and you've been so busy doing all the work of righteousness or work of religion that you forgot that there's deeper places to go. So you're just about to burn out going to church. You could last thing you need is another church service. You don't need another. You need an experience with God. But you know there's, He's willing and able. If you'll just magnify him, this is how it says it. If you'll draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. That old country song, you start walking your way, I'll start walking mine. What's cool about it is it doesn't say you'll meet in the middle. You just have to take a step. The Bible says when the prodigal son started home, it says the father was watching, saw him a long 
way off. They didn't meet in the middle. You understand, you're not going to get to the middle. You just start turning, and the Father starts running, is what the Bible says. And so I believe that we can start experiencing God here. I'm not the prophet. I'm not the inner healer. I'm not the evangelist. I'm just a pastor that I felt like the Lord told me today to come in here and prepare the way of the Lord for us to experience what He's longing to do in our lives. So we're going to open the altar up. The praise team is fixing to create an atmosphere because God moves in atmospheres. You create, you give God room in your life. He will always fill it. He's a filler. He's not a just comer, enter. He's a filler. He takes up every space. And so as you lift your hands over the next few minutes and you open your heart, I promise you, you will not have to walk out of here empty. He will fill every spot or area that you give him in the next three minutes. Do you know how long it took God to uh, do things? Just suddenly just suddenly it says and suddenly an angel appeared and suddenly an earthquake happened and suddenly the Red Sea parted you got to understand all God needs is a moment and everything can change so we're going to open it prepare the way oh magnify the Lord with me please let's exalt his name together there's an encounter on our horizon he's made an appointment for us and I'm believing in the next 30 days if you're hungry for the Lord, if you will set your calendar at some point in this revival, you're going to experience God in the way that you desperately need, need Him to. Amen? So let's do this together. Oh, magnify the Lord. Just stand and just come to these altars with us.